Thank you. Thank you to the chair. Thank you to the ranking member. And thank you to all the witnesses for coming today on this important hearing. Um, look, I think uh, even the most limited government conservatives do think that uh, the government has a role in keeping everyday Americans safe and with, uh, with safe drinking water. Um, now, it, and there's communities in my district, for instance, like Tamina, uh, don't have clean water. Uh, my office is dedicated to helping that community get the water that it needs. Um, but along that same theme, there's the key component in keeping uh, drinking water safe, which is chlorine. And last year, there was a brief supply disruption in the production of chlorine. It resulted in several communities sporadically losing access to chlorine products and requiring an abundance of boil water notices across the United States. Administrator Regan was so concerned about the communities losing access to chlorine that he actually sent an urgent letter to the chlorine manufacturers, reminding them that chlorine is used in the overwhelming majority of water systems and that they need to prioritize getting those shipments out the door. I'll submit this letter for the record. But that same EPA also advocated so strongly um, against the processes that create chlorine in the first place. Support chlorine, but just not how to make it. Because there's only two ways of making chlorine. One uses asbestos and one uses PFAS. And the EPA is working on a draft rule that bans asbestos. And this committee has worked on a plan. We've passed it out of this Congress to effectively ban PFAS, or at least create such extreme liability for producing it that many companies will simply choose not to do it. Um, so, Mr. Eddy, you've got a water system. Uh, you use chlorine, do you not? And uh, what, what, what do you make of this? What do you make of this? Uh, chlorine is, thank you, um, Congressman. Chlorine is crucial to our treatment process um, to provide safe drinking water. Um, disinfect, it's a, uh, disinfectant is widely used across the country um, to disinfect water. Um, we did see the, last year um, some of the Manufacturer having delays in processing and shipping chlorine, especially um, uh, early first quarter of um, 2021. Around that, um, is a <laughs> and, and can you import cheaper chlorine from abroad? I'm I'm not sure. I did. I never looked into that. The answer is no. You're not allowed to import chlorine. So you'd have to buy it locally. And if there's a scarce, if there's scarcity or if it just becomes prohibitively expensive because of the, we crack down on the processes to make it, you know, what do we do? Um, it's a rhetorical question. I don't think you know the answer. The, the, point, the point I'm making is it's a problem, and we cannot regulate in silos. We have to regulate with the entire picture in mind. And I think some of these pursuits have been reckless. They're short-sighted. It's also worth noting that chlorine isn't just a disinfectant for water systems, it's a foundational chemical for fertilizer and medicine as well. And look, it always, it always feels good to ban chemicals that you don't understand, but the question is, will it do any good? No, fear-mongering is often about feelings, not facts. And in this case, it could have serious consequences. Healthcare will be more expensive, food will be more expensive, water will be more expensive, because that's what happens when you create scarcity via excessive government regulations increased costs. And so I asked the committee today, with inflation being the number one problem facing everyday Americans, maybe we do away with this short-sighted crusade to effectively ban the very chemicals that we need the most. Uh, I still have some time left. And so, Mr. Olson, you were just talking about uh, the need to crack down on, on PFAS chemicals, but how do we do that without having the second and third order consequences that I just mentioned. And those, those are very real consequences. We talked to the industries that, that make these chemicals that we absolutely need. So how, how, do we, how do we thread the needle? Well, I was speaking to the need to uh, make sure that they're not in the drinking water to filter it out of the drinking water before people drink it. But I think there is a need to go towards reasonable controls on PFAS production. And the vast majority of PFAS um, can be replaced with other compounds. So firefighting foam is one example where it's in widespread use, and now all over the world, um, a lot of airports, for example, are phasing, have phased out PFAS-based um, firefighting foam. So a lot of the big uses, there are alternatives. There may be some crucial, um, absolutely essential uses that need to be re retained until we can find out if there's an alternative, but the basic problem is we're seeing a lot of profligate and I, and I just mentioned one of them. But those companies that, that make the, the PFAS membrane that will create chlorine, they will not do it when they are faced with trillion-dollar liabilities because of being regulated under CERCLA. 
So is well, this the right step to take? Well, I, what I'll say is if you're contaminating somebody's drinking water with PFAS, you ought to be responsible. But they're for not. They're sure making chlorine. And understand, there's, there, there's more to the supply chain than just the, nothing here is touching the drinking water. The PFAS is not contaminating the drinking water in this case. We're talking about how to make chlorine, which is the opposite of contaminating the drinking water. It's what allows you to have clean drinking water. I understand. I understand. What I'm referring to is a lot of the actual manufacturing of the PFAS has caused pretty widespread contamination in North Carolina and several other states. I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.